Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we focus on day-to-day -day clinical issues in gastroenterology. I'm Elaine Robertson, a gastroenterology consultant in Hairmeyer's Hospital in the west of Scotland. Today we're discussing perianal Crohn's disease and I'm delighted to welcome Mr George Ramsey, a clinical lecturer and surgical STA in Rigmore Hospital in the north of Scotland. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thanks very much for having me. Let's start with the basics. So what do we mean when we're talking about perianal Crohn's disease? So I think it's important to highlight that about 54% of patients that have Crohn's disease will have some element of perianal disease associated with um, the condition. It will either move from um, relatively benign symptoms such, or, or conditions such as hemorrhoids or fissures to much more complex disease such as deep cavitating ulcers and uh, water and can perineums at the, at the most extreme end. So perineal, uh, sorry, Crohn's disease is effectively a perineal condition as well as a luminal condition as well. So let's say I'm seeing a patient in clinic who is known to have Crohn's disease. What sort of features would lead me to investigate or think about the diagnosis? I think by virtue of having um, Crohn's disease, it's highly likely that they'll have an element of perineal disease. I think a history of any perineal discomfort, tenesmus, or any history of abscesses that um, at their perineum at any point would make it highly likely that they will have an element of perineal Crohn's disease associated with their condition. Um, Crohn's disease will present in about 10% of people with a, a perianal involvement to start with. And so it may be that in history, in the history of the patient, even up to 10 years beforehand, they've had an element of an abscess before the rest of their luminal disease will, will manifest itself. When we think about perianal or perineal Crohn's, we often think about fistulae. Is there a way of classifying fistulae? So the definition of a fistula is an abnormal communication between two epithelialized surfaces and that in the perineum is really between the rectum and the skin. Uh, there are a variety of different classification systems that are there but in the most basic form it can either be a simple fistula or a complex one. I think in order to define the um, fistulas fully it's important to describe the normal anatomy of the perineum. Uh, there are two sphincter complexes that involved in um, uh, faecal incontinence. The first one being the internal sphincter, that's under involuntary control, and it's um, a circular lining of the anal canal. The external sphincter is associated with the levator plate, and that's under voluntary control. So a simple fistula is an abnormal communication between the two uh, surfaces that doesn't go through the, the sphincter complex at all, whereas a complex one involves the sphincters um, as part of its path between the two surfaces. Are there other ways of classifying it maybe? Yeah, so there's, um, the Parks classification has used for perineal cro um, fistulas in general. It doesn't really have a place in Crohn's management, but it describes the, the route in which the fistulas will go through the, the sphincter complexes, either intersphincteric, transphincteric, or suprasphincteric, or extrasphincteric. The problem with Crohn's disease is it's such a debilitating condition and, and, and normal anatomy is sometimes quite altered and so these pathways don't necessarily help with the management of the patients um, that come in. And likewise, good solves law that we talk about where we um, talk about the anal um, verge as a, a clock face with 12 o'clock being the anterior component and 6 o'clock being the lower most component and dry, drawing a line between 9 and 6. The Good Soul's Law says that the, if sphinc the fistula tract should be a radial if it's above the, the line between 9 and 3 and then moving into the midline if it's below. Again, these rules don't apply to Crohn's patients, unfortunately. So the, as a result of the difficulty with the establishing the, patho the pathology and the anatomy, we rely on further tests in order to establish what's going on. And really, at the moment, it's either examinations under anaesthetic or an MRI beforehand in order to establish what to do next. OK, well, that, that leads me on, actually, to my next question. So if I think again about the patient in clinic and maybe they've got some of the features that you describe, mm. What tests are helpful to move things forward? Yeah, so I think um, establishing the extent of their luminal disease is important. So either, and if it's specifically perianal disease that we're, the patient's complaining of, at least a flexible sigmoidoscopy is relevant. 
and an MRI of their perineum, especially if we're thinking about um, fistula and um, whether they require an examination under anaesthetic. If we get the MRI before the examination under anaesthetic, we're able to reduce the risk of um, fistula recurrence down from 55% to about 16%. That all is in the context of somebody who's well enough not to have an examination under anaesthetic straight away. So patients with abscesses, the first treatment of these people is to incise and drain the abscess, deal with the sepsis, and then come back at a later date to look at the fistula tracts. And what are the goals of treatment? So the, the main goals of treatment are really to maintain continence of the patient and just drain any sepsis or any potential of sepsis that can develop over time. That can involve either having a seat and suture in situ that prevents any build-up of infection as time goes on, but certainly cutting the sphincter complexes will render the patient incontinent and so we try and re prevent any possibility of doing that. And can you tell early on whether this is going to be a fistula that you can achieve healing or whether actually it's going to be better to palliate this patient? So I think there are certain predictive markers. So the depth of the fistula tract and how many free, um, fistula are around about it. Certainly a patient with a watering can perineum is unlikely to be able to be treated purely just with drainage of the, uh, the, the fistula itself. If it's an isolated um, fistula or if it's a simple fistula that doesn't go through the tracks, all we need to do there is put a probe in through the fistula, ensure that there's no muscle associated with it, and then cut with diathermy to open it up, and that has a success rate of about 80%. So certainly the depth of fistulas would be the most impro important aspect. So I guess the most common scenario in Crohn's disease is complex fistulating disease. What are the initial steps here? So the initial steps here are really to, to drain the sepsis and el eliminate any abscess formations associated with that area. Once the sepsis is drained, and potentially this may require a second examination under anaesthetic in a few weeks after the, the initial incision and drainage, we then need to look at placing seat and sutures in situ to try and uh, prevent any buildup of the, um, of the infection as time has gone on. We can use long-term antibiotics to try and prevent that infection from building up but ultimately we also would require an MRI to make sure that we haven't missed any of the multiple fistulas that might be there and potentially go back for another examination under anaesthetic to place any further setons in situ. Um, and it would be important to start anti-TNF. What sort of time scale are we looking at? Yeah, so I, th I think that's where, I th I think that's where um, inflammatory bowel disease um, therapy is a really a multidisciplinary team approach. I think it's slightly different for each individual patient, and I think that's where the IBD MDT comes into its own. Um, we need to be confident that there isn't any indwelling or un underlying um, infection that's associated with this area uh, so that the, um, the immunobiologics can be started. Um, once we're confident that there isn't any infection there, then it's probably the best time to, to, to start it. And how do we reassess response? Yeah, so there's, for, there's response to the luminal disease um, and there's response to the fistula management itself. I think one of the problems with fistulation of Crohn's disease is that the evidence base isn't as strong as it is for luminal disease. And so we um, would assess it either by examination under anaesthetic again or repeat MRIs to see where the, the tracks are and how they are in relation to the sphincter complexes before we were to take them back to theatre. And what sort of time scale would you leave the seating in and carry on with the anti-TNF before we reassess and decide on the next step? Yeah, so it's important to highlight that this is a long-term management plan. These, can, these uh, setons can be in for periods of months at a time, and often patients that have had complex abscesses and, and fistulas that haven't been drained for a prolonged period of time can get quite a lot of relief by having the seton in situ. That being said, some patients really can't tolerate them very well and they're keen for them to be removed quickly. The time frame depends on the depth of the, seat, the, the fistula tract itself and how the patient is getting on. But I think the advice would be that we would be keen to remove them and change them under an, uh, under an anaesthetic rather than a clinic environment so that we can get a full appreciation of where they are in relation to the rest of the anatomy. And what factors affect your decision about whether the setum can come out or whether it needs to stay in? So there, the critical aspect of the sphincter complexes associated with this. 
if we can be absolutely confident that there's no sphincters involved and no muscles involved in the tract at that point, we would be in a position to drain the, uh, remove the fistula tract just by a fistulotomy. In relation to whether that's going to heal or not, it depends on the underlying um, Crohn's management. There are complex procedures that we can undertake in order to um, try and treat the fistula tract itself, but they would need to make, we need to be fairly confident that the patient's not going to need escalation in their immunobiologics before we're in a position to do that for the patients. So if we decide to remove the cetin, working towards a goal of fistula healing, how do we assess response? So the important factors here are really that um, removal of a cetin is probably something that we need to do at the point of a repeat examination under anaesthetic. And before that, we would ask for an MRI test just to establish how much sphincter involvement is in, uh, involved in the actual fistula tract itself. If it's removed in the clinic, it can sometimes cause undrained sepsis to build up as time goes on. So the timing of that is dependent on the depth of the fistula and the, the extent of the different fistula tracts that are associated with that. It's not uncommon for some cetins to be removed of, in, in the perineum of an individual patient with others to be changed at the point of a repeat EUA. And the time of that can either be months down the line or potentially between six weeks and, and two months before a change. And ultimately, what sort of rates of healing or response are we seeing? Yeah, so it, um, can, it, again, it can vary on the extent of the luminal disease associated with the pathology and the extent of the fistulas that are there as well. I'd say a watering can perineum with multiple fistula tracts are unlikely to establish entire healing of that area. Um, but an individual fistula on infliximab can have up to a 19% chance of recurrent recurrence and so healing about 80% of patients. And for the patients who don't have healing, are there any alternatives to seat and placement that you've described? Yeah, so in those instances, there are lots of complex um, fistula managements that are available. And I think it's probably important to say if there are multiple different um, treatments for an individual condition, it implies that none of them are particularly effective. So there are a few um, more complex operations that we can undertake, such as a uh, ligation of the intersphincteric fistula, where we tie off the fistula tract and then close the mucosa within the anus itself or the rectum. But they have a success rate quoted about 66% in patients that don't have Crohn's. And unfortunately, the rates are less in patients that do. There are other video-assisted approaches that we can undertake, but again, they are more effective in individuals that have, haven't got inflammatory bowel disease. So it is a very difficult condition to manage. So perianal Crohn's disease has a significant impact on patients. How do you think we can get better? So I, I think perianal Crohn's disease, if you look at patients with perianal Crohn's disease compared to those who have Crohn's disease and within the rest of their um, GI tract, uh, those with perianal disease have increased in suicidal ideation and I really think that's probably underappreciated and the psychological morbidities associated with this are probably really underappreciated. We're talking about a young population and we're talking about patients that have perianal leakage and faecal incontinence associated with it so it's an embarrassing condition as well and I think we very much underappreciate the psychological morbidity associated with this. No, that's a really important point. The other thing I think, if I may, is that we don't do very well at working together yeah. and that would probably be a big step forward. As one of my um, bosses at the moment says that a good IBD MDT needs an aggressive gastroenterologist and a benign surgeon and hopefully if you can find one of them it will work well as a team. Well thank you. All that remains really is for me to thank you for your time and for a fantastic update on an important condition and to thank you for joining us for Digest This. <laughs>